Culture Festival, we are delighted to introduce the next session, The Radical Potter, Josiah Wedgwood and the Transformation of Britain. Tristan Hunt is a historian, broadcaster, and current director of the Victoria and Albert Museum. His recent biography, The Radical Potter, Josiah Wedgwood and the Transformation of Britain, follows the journey of the greatest English potter who ever lived. Josiah Wedgwood masterfully revolutionized the production of ceramics in Georgian Britain by weaving together technology with design, manufacturing efficiency, and retail flair. Our first speaker, Tristan Hunt, is the director of Victoria and Albert Museum, the world's leading museum of art, design, and performance. Since taking up the post in 2017, he has championed design education in schools in the UK, encouraged debate around the history of the museum's global collections, and overseen its transition to a multi-site museum. Anita Anand is an award-winning radio and television journalist. Her book, The Patient Assassin, won the Penn Hessel Tiltman Award for the History Book of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen, the radical potter, Josiah Wedgwood, and the transformation of Britain. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, let me just tell you how this session is going to work. So uh, Tristram is going to do a presentation giving you a whistle-stop tour of a man that actually is a household name in Britain. If you don't know uh, why he's so important to Britain is people either have a piece of Wedgwood pottery in their home or aspire to have a piece of Wedgwood pottery in their home. There is no one better to talk about this because a lot like Wedgwood, uh, Tristram himself has spanned, his life has spanned the worlds of politics and also of art and aesthetic beauty. So Tristram, it's over to you. Anita, thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous privilege uh, to be with you here um, this morning in Jaipur, the city of blue pottery, a, a city which understands the importance uh, of design, of ceramics, of jewellery, uh, of fashion. And so as director uh, of the V&A, it's, it's, a, it's a great wonder uh, to be here at this brilliant festival uh, as well. Um, what I want to do um, is talk very briefly um, this morning about the history uh, of Josiah Wedgwood and really the, the global significance uh, of what he uh, achieved as a ceramicist. And hopefully we're going to have uh, some slides, which I can't quite see from... I might... I'm going to talk uh, from here to the slides, which hopefully you might be able to see. So if we could have the next slide, please. Um, so here you can see just a kind of wonderful uh, introduction to some of the ceramics that you have um, in Mumbai, which has a great Wedgwood uh, collection. Next slide, please. Um, but my journey begins for this story um, in the 1790s with the first British marketing expedition to China. Um, Earl McCartney, who was the first ambassador to Peking, travels in the 1790s with the great fruits of the British Industrial Revolution um, as a way of explaining to the celestial emperor of the wonder of British modernization and technological uh, progress. And with him go the very greatest figures of Georgian Britain, the artists, the designers, the manufacturers of the age. Such is the hubris, such is the self-belief of industrial Britain at this time that McCartney takes with him six Wedgwood vases. That the British thought they could teach the Chinese about making China. And the figure they thought would accompany this was Wedgwood. And when Wedgwood hears about this, he is unbelievably delighted. He says, I shall give you joy on my conquest of Peking. And 
this is such a significant moment because really, uh, next slide please. Um, the story of this, this book um, is about this east-west relationship. And I have to tell you that the Chinese emperor was not totally overblown when he saw the works of Josiah Wedgwood. Because when you compare and contrast the incredible porcelain coming out of the dragon kilns of Jing Zhen compared with the butter pots from Staffordshire, in the same period as you can see in this image, uh, you can see why there might be some skepticism uh, in the Chinese court about what they could learn uh, from Great Britain. Uh, and famously, the Chinese emperor said he had no use uh, or interest in these useless and frivolous toys. Next slide, please. But really, over time, uh, what Wedgwood uh, signifies um, is this, this journey um, we're going right back to the beginning now. Uh, <laughs> there. Next slide. There we go. In time, the Chinese emperor would have to take note of Wedgwood and really what Wedgwood symbolized, which is this story of a transition in power between West and East. Because Wedgwood's rise is also the story of the great readjustment in global economics. That moment when the European and the Atlantic economies begin to dominate the global economy relative to Mughal India or Qing China. And in the ceramics of Wedgwood, I seek to explore how you have this great readjustment that from the, the clay of North Staffordshire, from the most delicate pots coming out uh, of Stoke-on-Trent, you have this epochal change that the Industrial Revolution uh, brought forth. And so through the story of ceramics, you have this geopolitical story, you have this global economic story, and you have this story uh, of East and West. Next slide. And I think it's helpful to think about Josiah Wedgwood really in the same frame that we would think about someone like Steve Jobs today. To my mind, Wedgwood is to the Industrial Revolution what Steve Jobs is to the Digital Revolution. He is this defining figure of transformational economic and cultural change. Because not only is Wedgwood a brilliant ceramicist He's also this figure who combines, like Steve Jobs with Apple, this combination of manufacturing brilliance, design, marketing, branding, and global supply chains. And so what I want you to leave today's session with is that Josiah Wedgwood is more than thus this historic figure from Stoke-on-Trent. He's the Steve Jobs of the 18th century. Next slide. I got to know Wedgwood in a sense because I was formerly the Member of Parliament, the Labour Member of Parliament uh, for Stoke-on-Trent. And when I arrived in Stoke in 2010, the figure of Wedgwood, and here you can see him outside uh, the train station um, in Stoke, um, in front of the worst hotel in England, the North Stafford uh, Hotel. Never, ever stay there. Um, he, is this, he is this great figure in the history of Britain and Stoke-on-Trent, but the business was collapsing, and in 2010, uh, the business went into um, insolvency. Um, actually, 2009. Um, and so I was part of this campaign to help save the collection. Next slide. And today the collection lives on uh, as part of the VNA Wedgwood collection. And it was during that campaign that I got to know the importance of Wedgwood, this remarkable, interesting, philosophical, transformational figure. Next slide. So Wedgwood is born in Stoke-on-Trent, in North Staffordshire, in the Midlands of England, the Potteries, in 1730. He comes from a generation uh, of potters stretching back uh, two centuries. Next slide. Um, and here you can see some of the images uh, really later from the 1830s of manufacturing ceramics, the mixing of the clay. Pottery takes place in North Staffordshire because you have this wonderful combination of the clay and the coal together that you dig up uh, the red Staffordshire clay, that's why we have potholes 
uh, in England because they're just digging up the clay and alongside the coal seams to fire the kilns uh, to fire the uh, ceramics. Next slide. Um, Wedgwood is part of this um, uh, community of makers and designers and his brilliance comes from the fact that um, age 12 in 1742 he's struck down by smallpox uh, and it infects his leg and the power in his leg is weakened and so he cannot tread the threadle, he cannot become a thrower of pots, he lacks the power to do that. And actually later he would have his leg amputated beneath the knee without anaesthetic. Um, at the age of 31, and it took place on the 31st of May, which he always wrote in his diary as St. Amputation Day, um, which is also my birthday, by the way. So Wedgwood could not become a thrower. He becomes a designer, and his brilliance is, in a sense, to use his mind to transform the shape uh, of pottery. And here you see some of his early uh, designs, where he takes that passion, that Rococo Baroque, interest uh, in the world's uh, emerge these global designs, the pineapple, the cauliflower, and he uses the greens and the yellows to create these remarkably interesting uh, designs, which he's at the forefront of. Next slide, please. But his most important breakthrough, and this is where he takes on China at China, is to make something called creamware. And you will know that there was this great ambition for European courts to imitate Chinese porcelain. Uh, and uh, Augustus of Saxony goes mad trying to do it, and, and, and Sèvres is imitating it. And Wedgwood's brilliance is not to get sucked into porcelain, because it's too expensive, it's too delicate, it's too complicated. So he makes a cheap version of porcelain called creamware. And the brilliance of creamware is not only uh, is it less brittle, not only is it cheaper to make, you can also add copper printed transfers to it. So it's a fashionable product. And here you can see his pheasant design on the creamware. And this is the material that is then exported around the world, across the British Empire, across the northeastern seaboard, uh, across Europe. And Wedgwood where becomes just known as English tableware, that when you're using English tableware, really this is the creamware coming out of North Staffordshire, exported, uh, taken up the canals to Liverpool and down to London, uh, and taken right around the world. Next slide, please. Crucial to this is his business partner, who we might talk a bit more about later, uh, Thomas Bentley. And the business is called Wedgwood and Bentley. And Bentley is this remarkable Liverpool merchant, a very metropolitan figure, who's a great salesman, who also introduces Wedgwood to more historical designs. And part of the joy of writing this book was tracing all the letters from Wedgwood to Bentley, one of these great friendships uh, in the history um, of uh, design. And somewhere out there are Bentley's letters back to Wedgwood, which we've never found. They will come up at auction at some point uh, in the next 10, 20 years, and our understanding will be uh, transformed. So Thomas Bentley, enormously important in the history uh, of Josiah Wedgwood. Next slide. And then also his third cousin, uh, and then his wife, uh, Sally Wedgwood. Um, Sally is a very important figure in Wedgwood's life, who he trusts utterly. Not only does she introduce four million pounds worth of extra capital into the business when they marry, which is always useful, uh, but it was a love marriage, and she helps with his designs. She, um, she, she always stress tests the new uh, uh, teapots and the cups and saucers to see whether they work in the hand. Uh, and she also, next slide, uh, delivers uh, a wonderful and loving uh, family for Josiah Wedgwood. And, and here you can see this great portrait by Stubbs. And we know it's a Stubbs picture because he puts much more effort into the horses uh, than he does uh, into the human figures. Um, and here you can see this wonderful mise-en-scene. And at the heart of it is, is his daughter, uh, Suki uh, Wedgwood. Um, Suki Wedgwood marries... Uh, the son of his 
uh, great friend Erasmus Darwin. She marries Robert Darwin. And Suki and Robert Darwin have a son called Charles Darwin. Uh, and so Charles Darwin's grandparents are Josiah, grandfathers are Josiah Wedgwood and Erasmus Darwin. And when you realize that those were his grandfathers, you begin to think actually he was intellectually something of an underperformer uh, when that lineage uh, comes to light. We're pressed for time, so I just want to make a few more points. Next slide, please. Um, Wedgwood's wealth and the success of the business is built upon that great 18th century moment of the Atlantic economy, the triangular economy, built upon colonialism and slavery, bringing extraordinary wealth into Britain, which then grows a consumer economy. And not only is this this world of Bridgerton, it's also this world of conspicuous consumption, that it is no longer a virtue not to display your wealth. In fact, a liberal economy and civil society is based upon excessive expenditure. That, in the words of Mandeville, private vices deliver public benefit. Next slide. And so from this, Wedgwood flows into this great retail world. And here you can see his shop. He transforms shopping, this retail experience. And he's also in charge of branding. That he manages to convince Queen Charlotte, the wife of King George III, to become a patron of his ceramics. And in doing so overnight, creamware becomes queensware. And Wedgwood styles himself Majesty Potter to Her Majesty. And he always knew, because of the kind of social climbing and aspirational nature of British society, that if you began at the top, if you began at the head, the middle classes would soon follow. So he always focuses on capturing the aristocratic and the royal market whilst then appealing uh, to the public. Let me make one final point. If we move uh, through the slides, I'll tell you when to stop. If we keep going, because I want to get to the point about him being a radical. Because amidst, amidst all this, uh, we also have uh, this belief um, in radicalism. Uh, because Wedgwood was a, a patriot, if we stop there, go one back. Um, he was a patriot who always had this strong belief that the forces of democracy and accountability were profoundly important in British society. So he is a supporter of democratic reform in the mid-1700s. He is a supporter, as you can see here, of the American Revolution. He secretly supplies radical intaglios to the American revolutionaries with the legend, don't tread on me. Next slide. He even supports the storming of the Bastille and the French Revolution, here producing a pin in Jasper Ware uh, to celebrate the storming of the Bastille. And there's this letter saying, I know my business might suffer, but I believe in the principles of radicalism and liberty, and I'm willing to support that. Next slide, please. And above all, he believes in the abolition of the slave trade. Despite having made his money it, through a colonial economy, he becomes, he creates the defining symbol for abolitionism in the late 1780s and 1790s. The image of the enslaved African in chains with the legend, am I not a man and a brother, becomes the defining symbol for those who campaigned for the end of the trade in enslaved Africans uh, completed um, in 1807. And Wedgwood believed in this for humanitarian grounds as a nonconformist and a radical. So he is this fascinating, conflicted, global figure of the 18th century. And I very much hope you enjoy the book. Thank you. Tristram, thank you very much indeed. I, I have no doubt you will enjoy this book because it is beautiful, it is layered, uh, it is well-crafted like a Wedgwood, in fact. Um, 
I'm really fascinated in, I mean, you sort of alluded a little bit to the conflict and the complexity of the man. So um, let, let's dive into that, and then I want to go back in, into his inspiration. What made him? What, what kind of forged? What was the kiln that made him? Well, let's go back to that in a minute, because you've just ended on two re really interesting slides. So the first question I have is that this is a man who believes that you know, there should be freedom. You know, that, that, that very famous medallion of the rattlestake for the American Revolution, don't tread on me. But he has also a very firm belief that colonialism is right, that you need to tame the savage. You know, that uh, it was a pervasive belief at the time, but it was also his belief. It wasn't, there were others who didn't believe it, but he did. How do you explain that and have your peace with that? I think um, w w when it, I mean, you're, you're totally right. There's, there, there's this conflict at the heart of Wedgwood, and you can see when there are these great naval victories by, by the British Navy at Portobello and elsewhere, that he is full of admiration for the expansion uh, of British naval and imperial power, partly because it's a very good commercial moment that everyone will now want to buy ceramics with designs of Admiral Keppel or other great figures. So there's a commercialism to it. There's also this, this, this strong kind of patriotic feel about the extension of British power through force. But for him, it is an empire of liberty. For him, there is this belief uh, in Protestantism and liberty that he feels for all now how we understand it, that this, is a, that this is a force for good. And where it goes wrong is where he sees it going wrong in North America because he sees dictatorship uh, and arbitrary power and authoritarianism looming. And he really feels that Jefferson and Washington and others are the, are the holders of Magna Carta and that system of English liberty. And then he becomes convinced of the humanitarian case for ending the enslaved, uh, the, the systems of slavery. He's not a believer in racial equality in any sense. Um, and m most of those who campaigned for the abolition of the trade in slaves in England were not believers in racial equality. They felt that slavery was a stain on the idea of England and the belief of England as a place of liberty. And one of, obviously one of the criticisms of the Americans was then they were continuing with this. So it, it was a belief in a kind of, there was a kind of radical component to his understanding of empire, which was not based on any conception uh, of racial justice. Mm. And, and again, just before we go back to what is an extraordinary origin story, if he was a Marvel character, we'd need to go into this uh, in depth. But just, just before that, just another contradiction that I'm frankly fascinated uh, with. He was a tr free trade advocate. He spoke passionately about it, he wrote brilliantly about it, and yet he wanted to restrict China's entry into the British market. And again, I'm, I'm help me, I'm confused. How did that work? So, as ever, free trade was a good idea when you had a competitive advantage. Uh, so free trade was a tremendously good idea with France, um, with some of the German states, because Britain was now powering ahead through the Industrial Revolution uh, with the manufacture uh, of ceramics. He was always incredibly fearful of any hint of free trade from Ireland or China, because he thought it would be undercut. And actually, also, uh, there was this great um, transfer of skills from North Staffordshire uh, to the Midwest in America. So he was also fearful of what was going to happen in America. So it was a, it, 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 it was a very uh, kind of codified idea uh, of what free trade should be. It was very much free trade as a vehicle, you know, yeah, and, and this is the, this, you know, this is exactly the conversation with China for the next 50 years about punching into Chinese markets wh which were underexploited, uh, but not in any sense a kind of 
a, it, there was not a Cobden ideal of free trade. It, 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 it was a much more kind of aggressive competitive advantage model. Well, I mean, it, and it's so contemporary. I mean, it's entirely the, the debate that Western powers are having right now. Uh, and the, and the we want in, about, but we don't want you in here. No. <laughs> you know? And the argument, the, the, the sort of the arguments about opening up China, these, these arguments in the 1790s about the kind of unfairness with which they're precluding British goods and things, is, you, 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 it, it could be easily from the last decade. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. I, say, I urge you, just if you're interested in contemporary politics, that could be in the Financial Times right now, a lot of this stuff. Right, can, let's go back. I know, I know we skipped, but I just was enchanted by those, those end slides. Uh, but the, the the origin story itself, you touched upon the challenges that he had as a very, very young boy. He, I think he described himself as the lowest rung on the ladder because he, he wasn't a very good potter. <laughs> you know, he just, apart from the smallpox issue, he had better potters in his family. And then that terrible illness takes him and he's bed bound for a very, very long time. There are, there are eminent people like Gladstone who you should explain why he's such a huge figure in British politics who, who truly believe if he hadn't been sick, he wouldn't have been that special when it comes to politics. Um, tell us a little bit about, first of all, Gladstone's love affair with him is charming. And second of all, is that, in your mind, true, that sickness gave him vision? So w William Gladstone, the, the great uh, liberal prime minister of the mid-19th century, was part of this Victorian community of scholars who really revered Wedgwood. Samuel Smiles, uh, in his book, Character, has Wedgwood as one of his kind of defining figures. And Gladstone in 1863 opens the Wedgwood Institute in Burslem, um, in Stoke-on-Trent, as a school of design. And there delivers this incredible speech celebrating the life and meaning of Josiah Wedgwood, really as a kind of template for young people uh, in Britain today. And he establishes this moment um, of, because of... Gladstone's wonderful evangelical mindset that Wedgwood had to go into the valley to come back out, that he almost had to be redeemed. Uh, and so this illness, this terrible illness, uh, is for Gladstone the kind of pivot point um, in, his, uh, in his life. I, I think it, 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 it is important to understand the, 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 the significance of Wedgwood as a designer. Um, someone who draws upon, and will, part of that is the story of the move to neoclassicism later, that he is a very gifted and brilliant designer, and he is not as able as many of his contemporaries as a thrower. Um, we're beginning to think he wasn't quite as, 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 as desperate as originally thought, but he is from this long line of Wedgwoods, and there's something in that really interesting way that picks him out that he's originally an apprentice to his brother, but then, you know, no elder brother likes a very clever younger brother. Uh, <laughs> and so the apprenticeship kind of dissolves and he has to go and find his way. And he works through a number of different businesses. And then he, he, he has the kind of mentoring and support which allows him to flourish. And then he's away. Um, and it's, it's, it's it, it, that kind of, and that's why the Victorians loved him. That mm. inner drive, that sense of purpose is, uh, is incredible. But the, the illness is, it's too good for biographers to, to ignore that kind of pivot moment uh, yes, in his early yes, years. Yes, the sweaty brow, lying in bed, seeing visions of uh, the way to wait, make the world better. And actually, you know, that, that is fascinating about him. He, he, like the Victorians and predating the Victorians, uh, did not see a separation between beauty and commerce and politics and improvement of human lives, which, which was extraordinary and set him apart as a radical. I think that's really significant. That there's this totalizing sensibility to Wedgwood, that the manufacturing of goods, the design of goods, the export of goods, the imagery uh, of goods is profoundly important. And, and it's a total vision, really in a sense of the modernization uh, of uh, the country. This, and again, this is why the Victorians love them. This very, very strong idea um, in progress. Let me talk for one moment about mm, the do. frog service. If we loop back uh, a few slides, uh, please, um, if possible, keep going and I'll tell you when to stop. Um, let's, let's, just there, perfect. 
So Catherine the Great of Russia um, is this reforming figure um, within uh, uh, her, her kingdom. And, and she seeks, um, and I'm nervous explaining this in front of Orlando Figes, but she seeks to transform her nation. And she looks to England as this nation of civil society, wealth creation, rule of law, modernizing aristocracy, trading nation. And she wants her court to be inspired by the idea of England. And so what she does in this totally brilliant and incredible way is commission a dinner service celebrating the ideal of England. And so Josiah Wedgwood is the only potter brave enough to say, OK, I will explore the notion of England and indeed Britain for you through a dinner service. And it's called the frog service because you can see a frog at the top um, of uh, the plate um, because there were frogs near one of her, her palaces um, in uh, Russia. And it's this kind of equipoise ideal beginning here with Kew Gardens. Next slide, please. Um, then uh, a plate um, which celebrates the uh, industrial uh, revolution. Um, if we could have the next slide. Um, here, I don't know if you can see it. This is Colebrookdale in Shropshire. Catherine the Great of Russia has commissioned a dinner service with an image of a train in Colebrookdale in Shropshire because this is the story of wealth creation uh, and modernization. Uh, and Wedgwood is the man to symbolize this. And I suppose, again, why, why Wedgwood is such an interesting figure for me is that there is this exploration of socio-political thought, uh, an idea of Britain through the ceramic uh, form. Uh, and the frog service uh, as an exploration of politics through ceramics, just as with those radical components, um, is, is another reason to my mind uh, why Wedgwood is so compelling. I mean, but there's so many. There are, I mean, your, and your book does this, this wonderfully. Um, you know, it, it may be self-serving, but there is also, you know, a huge... Um, the pulpit thumping that goes goes with it. So there is the idea that he and Bentley want to make a canal service. Now, you know, one of the things is it's kind of good to get his stuff in and out, but the other, it brings commerce. Uh, he wants total total employment. Let's talk about total employment. What was that theory? That's that's very fascinating. This this strong idea. Let, let, let me just touch on canals first, because again, Wedgwood is the treasurer of the Trenton Mersey Canal. Uh, and being the treasurer, he ensures it goes right past his factory. Um, and so suddenly the unit costs of bringing the clay, which is increasingly from uh, Devon and Cornwall in the southwest, up to Staffordshire, and then exporting the works up to the Liverpool docks, not only are you not having so many breakages on the terrible roads, you're also being able to reduce your transport costs. And the profits are exponential. Um, uh, through that. So each of these moments of modernization, uh, of bringing it together, uh, are so important. And with employment, uh, th there's, there's a challenge really, I think, with Wedgwood. And it's again one of the contradictions. Because on the one hand, he is this, this great designer and artist, and hopefully I've shown you some of his creative brilliance. But the outcome of his genius is really the beginnings of the modern factory system. And he famously says that he wishes to make machines of the men such as cannot err. So actually, he's there in a sense to strip away the creative impulse of the workers and turn them into machines, each one through the division of labor, doing a smaller and smaller piece of work to increase the profit outcome. So this figure who is such an important person in the history of design and art and human flourishing and creativity is also at the beginning of that very kind of Marxian dehumanization of the worker uh, within the factory context. I mean, you're just reminded me of all the reasons. I'm really confused. I don't know whether I like him. It's a, it's a real, I mean, it's a real struggle. You can admire uh, the impact somebody has had. I mean, uh, since we're talking contradictions and we're among friends, I also have a real confusion about being an abolitionist, 
for whatever the reasons were at the time, you know, that Christianity is the model of freeing people, fine. Okay, that was the thought process of the day. But if you're an abolitionist and you're friends with, he was friends with Oliver Equiano, an amazing first slave narrative that changed everything in Britain. But he's also exporting sugar bowls and crockery to slave owners in America. And he's doing my head in at this point, because I don't know whether I like you, Josiah Wedwood. He, he, I mean, the, the, sh the sugar industry and the kind of paraphernalia around the rituals of tea serving and the rituals of coffee serving and the rituals of hot chocolate on the, is great business. Because the more ritual you have, the more ceramic pieces you need, the more production you get. And so sugar bowls and all of that context is, is, is part of it. And later, the Wedgwood family, which is this radical family, will become, particularly the female Wedgwoods, will become amongst the great anti-saccharine campaigners. They will campaign against the use of sugar in the 1820s and 1830s because they understand how intimately it is connected with the nature of slavery. But in the 1770s and 1780s, no one is thinking in that way. No one is thinking of, as it were, boycotting or not supplying or moving away from the provision of sugar within the ceramics industry. And even to get to the abolitionist point, within Staffordshire circles, Wedgwood is an outlier. So it, it is a contradiction from where we sit, but I, I think, and it's, uh, whether it's helpful or unhelpful, I don't know, but thinking of the slave industry and the slave trade in the 1760s and 1770s, and maybe 1780s, is almost like thinking of it as the, the oil industry, that it is just a almost given component of British and European society. And yes, you have campaigners, just as we have campaigners today against many of these components. But in terms of the vast majority, certainly in the kind of manufacturing and commercial circles Wedgwood was, was in, this was a given. Uh, and so even to get to that abolitionist point for him, compared to his peers, uh, was, was as part of a kind of Quaker and non-conformist tradition, uh, what was an outlier. So I'm going to open it up to, to the floor. So please put your hands up in the air very clearly. Uh, and we're going to come to you. There's a question straight away, the gentleman in the white polo shirt. Don't be shy. Um, just do, if you've got a thought, put your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. So you spoke, uh, you spoke a bit about how Josiah Wedgwood made shopping an experience and all of that, right? And he's also known for using illustrated catalogs and direct mail and all these innovations. Could you talk about the world he was operating in and how his work had an impact on the world of marketing and how that changed and what it was before him and the impact he had? Thank you. Yes. Um, I mean, Wedgwood is, is a transformative figure um, in marketing from that notion of brand, that, that notion that if you've got, as we'd say, influencers today, that is going to shape um, how, how others approach the product. He focused with laser precision on, as he said, doing the needful with the ladies, that you focused on the female market. Uh, and that's why Sally was so um, important. So having a retail space where you could sort of imagine, not just as a kind of big warehouse, but you could imagine uh, the crockery set out on the table and how it uh, would look. Having product launches, uh, selling tickets to the launch of a new season, uh, and then also just the real nuts and bolts of having salespeople traveling around uh, the country. Um, and, <laughs> and the speed with which he would also, with no nostalgia, with drop designs that weren't selling. I mean, actually, he would flog them to the Caribbean market. He always felt that the... the, 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 the well, they'll the take of, any toot over they there. Were, okay, the kind of, right. He felt the kind of plantation owners were pretty slow on the fashion, so you can right. get rid of the kind of back stock to them. Uh, and the new market was in London and Cheltenham and Brighton and, and, and the smart uh, spaces. And, and so you had some of these components before, and Wedgwood, of course, emerges, whether it's in manufacturing or design or uh, or making um, 
out of a community, but he really, him and Bentley really take it forward. And I would, I, I would point to um, the advertising, the brand management. There's this lovely moment when they franchise the sales of their product to a third party in Bath, in the great spa town of Bath. And they find that the franchisee is handing out leaflets saying, you know, come and get your Wedgwood here. And they think this is devaluing the brand. So they remove the franchise from him uh, and resell it to someone else. So it's an incredibly sophisticated um, operation. And I do think, I mean, this is where hopefully my kind of Steve Jobs analogy holds, uh, that in marketing uh, and product placement uh, and, uh, and, and, and those kind of fields, he really is uh, a game changer. Uh, yes, there's a question with the, the red shirt and show me at the back because I always neglect the back because I'm short-sighted. There we are, there's a blue hand, I see you. Let's go for the red first. Yes, you sir. Yes, just following on from that, so how did he protect his brand against the look-alike rip-offs? I mean, presumably as you went down the social scale, there would be more manufacturers doing Wedgwood look-alikes. Did he try and eliminate those in some way? He, he, he did. I mean, he, he um, not only um, was he really concerned about industrial espionage, um, and he's always sort of throwing workers out who he thinks are kind of selling. And within, within the stoke on trade pottery trade, people are always kind of, you know, taking ideas and moving from one company to another. But crucially, what Wedgwood does is, um, I mean, the Saxon porcelain... Uh, the court porcelain had done this first in ceramics, but it had been done in silverware for a long time. He introduces the back stamp. He introduces the signifier of quality, that when you turn over the plate, it would be Wedgwood and Bentley. It would be WB. Uh, and those of you uh, who know anyone from Stoke-on-Trent will know that if you have them for dinner, or if you're in a restaurant, they will always surreptitiously turn over the plates or the saucer or the cup just to see where it was made, to see if there's a back stamp. Uh, and this lasts a very long time. And, and when I was a member of parliament in Stoke, we always had this sort of fight with some companies who would, as it were, put England or Stoke on, on the base of their, their plates, but have them made in China or Thailand uh, and have false back stamping. So an authentic back stamp was an important part. Yeah, I mean, all, all things are cyclical I and mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, there was a, a young lady, I think, with a green top. Yes, please. Hi, Anita. Nice to see you. I love the Empire podcast. Oh, th <laughs> thank you. But it's not about me. What, what, what was your question? Um, it's not really about Wedgwood, but mostly about Empire. And since you've written about the Kohinoor and we have the VNA director here, I was hoping both of you could comment on a uh, more sensible approach to reparations and return of artifacts. Well, you know what? What, a, what an interesting question. Um, we did have a chat. I thought this might come up. Talk about conflict. You got a lot of lovely Indian stuff in your museum. What you gonna do? <laughs> it's a it's a great it's a great question. Um, so across Britain now, many museums from Glasgow to Oxford to the Horniman Museum in London to Exeter to elsewhere are restituting items, are returning items to source countries and communities beginning with the object and the history of the object and beginning with provenance research and understanding in a much more rigorous way uh, where many of these items came from. The British Museum and the Victoria and Albert Museum and a couple of other museums are prevented by government legislation from deaccessioning, from removing any items in their collection. So there's a political solution to this conversation which needs to take place. I mean, it's a fairly recent piece of statute as well. It's not, it's not going back centuries or anything. No, the British Museum is 1963 uh, and the v is 1983. Um, and so I know that the Indian government with the G20 coming up, are, are, I want to have a conversation uh, around this. So what we do at the museum in the face of that legislative barrier is operate what we call renewable cultural partnerships where we 
participate and collaborate with colleagues around the world to share our collections. And at the moment, we have indigenous Tasmanian uh, necklaces uh, on show um, in New Zealand. Uh, we have returned uh, the head of a Roman, uh, baby Eros Roman sarcophagus uh, to Turkey. We're in conversations with Ethiopia and Ghana around these cultural partnerships that make these objects a bridge to collaboration and partnership and curatorial work and conservation work in the future. And I think that's the way we should go in the future. I think part of that, there'll be some items that absolutely uh, will probably be in different places uh, in decades to come, but the majority will stay in their same positions because of the importance of museums as spaces for the comparative of comparative analysis of global cultures, and also because of the growing number of diasporic communities with mixed and multiple heritages around the world. And museums are stories of multiculturalism. They're stories of exchange. Uh, they're stories uh, of complicated and histories through the object. So I'm, I'm open and up for this conversation. Oh, and to be fair, I mean, to be, I mean, you have led the way in, in finding innovative ways around this law. I mean, I, I think that's fair to say. And, you know, permanent loans, could they be a thing? You know, is that a way to sidestep saying oh, we will permanently loan you the bronzes that we have or, or the Ranjit Singh throne or whatever else there is? So we, we've had a permanent loan to a, a, a monastery in Spain since the early 1980s. We've had loans to museums in Oman for many years. Uh, the works in, in, in Turkey will be there for many years to come. But I also think we, it, it, it builds a bigger conversation around not just communities and nations, but then it allows us to think about sharing Wedgwoods and mm. Turners and items of English and British culture more favorably. So if it can become this vehicle for a richer circularity of objects, alongside being totally open and transparent about the colonial and imperial past and the way in which these objects entered collections, I think that's a really good way forward. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I, I'm not... Thank you, and, and, and I won't, I, we're doing a session on Empire, so we'll, we, we can talk about the Koenor um, and other things then, uh, but it ain't coming back anytime soon. <laughs> Let me put it that way. It's not in my collection. No, it's not in his collection. He does not answer for it, but the, it is turned into an utter diplomatic grenade. Let's put it that way. Come to our session, we can chat about it. Uh, we've got 30 seconds, but I just want to ask one thing. Uh, uh, you are... Um, uh, I mean, I think you're a loss to politics, um, you, you know that, but also just when you look at the political field, do you mourn the quality of people like Wedgwood who just thought in a holistic way, you know, had such a breadth of vision? Do you see that in our current politics? Well, Wedgwood himself always thought everyone in Parliament was a donkey. Um, and, and wanted annual parliaments so that you could get rid of, <laughs> get rid of them as, as quickly as possible um, in that chartist way. I think, we, I think we do have, and the wonder of JLF um, is that we, we do have thinkers today who range very, very widely. I think having makers and designers and artists who range that widely is something we don't have, but we also sometimes don't provide them with the space to allow them to feel confident to explore social and political issues uh, more widely. Um, and in England, you know, if we think of a kind of potter with a political, you know, purpose and feel, Grayson Perry is obviously someone who, who is there but I tell you, he's now Sir Grayson Perry, and the establishment has their eye on him. So uh, it'll, 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 you know, we'll, we'll see whether the radicalism survives. Well, I, I can just encourage you, please, if you have questions, go get the book, go chat to, to Tristram. He's very chatty, and it's, uh, it's utterly fascinating. I got a lot from this book, and I hope you will too. Please join me in thanking Tristram Hunt. We would like to thank Tristan Hunt and Anita Anand for this riveting discussion. Tristan Hunt will be signing book at the book signing desk located on my right.
Please check our websites for the latest updates. Please keep us in keeping the festival venues clean and dispose of your waste in the waste bins placed across Hotel Clark's Amir. Subscribe to the Jaipur Literature Festival YouTube channel to access all the sessions. And we'd love to hear from you on our social media, so please tweet using hashtag Jaipur Literature Festival 2023 and tag at Jaipur Literature Fest. There is.